So do I call this? Uh, I was debating, Jason, if I should call this episode 200, or should I go the naked gun route and call it episode 199 and a third? <laughs> I think people will get mad if you do that. You think? Really? Yeah. Well, then it's one ninety nine and a third. <laughs> I like so upsetting then people. Next, then the next one's two thirds. <laughs> yeah, we'll just keep doing that until we get two hundred. Then at the end, you'll be going to eights. Yeah. Whatever comes after that. Because I did have people remind me uh, that I did say that possibly 200 would be the last episode ever so they don't want me to they don't want me to break that promise <laughs> <laughs> they're like you promised so now i got you because this is 199 and a third you promised well what you could also do is you could go into 199.1 <laughs> 199.2 like like the releases of the car kits you know yes we could do that <laughs> like the the associated kits yeah v2 <laughs> one night episode 199.1 is up there for you guys right now yeah they'd be like oh are you kidding me or we can go the x-ray route and do like um one podcast every six months. <laughs> <laughs> and call it, uh, you know, the edition. It's like the, a, the 2019 edition. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then six months later, 2020. They're like, man, these guys are just moving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, speaking of X ray, the world. Yeah. Good event. Looked awesome. It was. Jeez. They put on a hell of a show. Yeah. I don't know how much money they spent putting that <laughs> event on. I was going to ask you. I have no... I'm like, wow. I, dude, they spent three days setting up the banquet. Three days? Wow. Yeah. They were out there three days put, putting that banquet together. I was like, holy cow. Looked great. Looked great. Yeah, but... Yeah, between the stage and the lighting and the backdrop and then the tables and then food. And I think they set up for big weddings faster than that. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I saw some people out there were saying like, oh, uh, everyone owes um, X-Ray or Hootie uh, an apology. And I'm like, well, I didn't, you know. I don't know if we owe him an apology. I, I don't think we said that's going to be a crap event. We just was a little bit worried about the home field advantage. Yeah, I think I don't want to water it down too much, but I think, yeah, I mean, essentially, um, that was what we were afraid of is that there would be, there was too big of an advantage for them. And I think, to be honest, there still was a large advantage for them. Yeah. Um, because anytime you can race more than somebody else on a condition or in a facility, it's an advantage. And they took advantage of it more than anybody else, I guess you could say. Because as somebody did point out to me, maybe Bruno in the interview that I did, he said, hey, we did have a warm up. We did have open practice for like a week or two afterwards. So if you wanted to, you could you could have practiced for two weeks if you wanted to. But but then Ty Tessman did he didn't do that and he went back there later and ran later on. So between when like Ty ran the worlds and like when he practiced there was only like a month difference. Mm. You know, Spencer was like two or three months uh, somewhere around there. But of course, then they redid the track, got it together, but they didn't redo the surface. They just like took all the pipes up, repiped it, and con they left all the jumps in place. And then they reconnected the pipes to use all the jumps that were there. Um, there was still an advantage for X-ray, but in more in particular, 
there was more of an advantage for the guys that ran um, the warm up plus the practice afterwards. Um, but there was guys that came in and did not run and were plenty competitive. So I think from that standpoint, um, people's predictions were a little bit off. I think, uh, you know, I think Spencer predicted and some others that people that didn't go to the warm up would have trouble being competitive. But there was people that showed up that didn't run the warm up or practice and they were fast. So I think overall, um, maybe what it shows you is there's certain guys you just can't hold back no matter what. It's not that you're holding them back. It's that they're going to be fast regardless. I think that's a better way of saying it. Yeah. Um, it's not like you're holding anybody back, but you're just, they're going to be fast regardless. And I think that's what some people showed. And then the people that did the extra work did the warm up, did the practice afterwards and worked on their cars. They were even more successful. But uh, to be honest, uh, like I, I, I don't remember if I put this online or not, but I think it's the best worlds I've ever been to. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, while I was there, I said it to several people. I said, I, I don't know if I've been to a better worlds than this. And uh, everything just turned out. Um, it turned out really well. You know, I think in general, people would have preferred the track surface to be a little different. I was fine with the jumps and the size. <clears throat> I think most would have liked the surface to be a little different, but everybody, everybody adjusted and, and they made it work. And this is, and I saw you guys saying like, it was like the surface back from when we used to race back in the, back in the day. <sighs> mm. Yeah. I mean, everybody has their own version of what back in the day means, um, but I think really more than anything is it was a surface that did not gain traction throughout the weekend uh, due to anything being put on it, due to the rubber of the tires, due to anything. It didn't gain traction. So you were always sort of at ground zero in terms of uh, the traction. And like Mayfield and some of the other guys said, he's like, you know, He's like, it really wasn't as bad as he thought it was going to be compared to what people were telling him. But he said, I also came here kind of prepared for it to be that way. You know, he had his car set up differently and kind of ready to go. Whereas I think the other guys, when they went there for the warm up, like Spencer, he was set up to run a more traditional surface and they took them a while to get up to speed. But by the time Mayfield showed up to the actual worlds, he had already set his car up for a loose track. So, mm -hmm. um, and he was, he did pretty well. Um, I, I felt like he should have did better in four wheel. His mains didn't go that well in four wheel. I thought he was a top five guy in both classes and he finished fifth and two wheel. And then he ended up, I think he qualified sixth and got ninth and four wheel. And I, I thought that was a little disappointing in four wheel because there was several mains. He was in like fourth place right behind third and then kind of got into it with a, anyway, either another car or just messed up and then ended up in the back of the pack. <laughs> but I, I think he should have been, I think he should have been a top five guy in both classes and, and he was in two wheel and you're just not going to get much higher than that in results. If you don't qualify a little higher, you know, if you qualify like in the top four or three, then you can kind of do something with that. But uh, you know, like the two races he got, he got third in one of the two wheel mains and basically somebody took somebody out on the start. So he passed like two or three cars on the first lap and that's how he got third in that race. Mm. Cause otherwise he, he said he's just, you know, he was just following guys and 
whatever happened happened. You know, it's not like he could just throw some wicked pass on somebody and, uh, you know, you kind of are just at the, uh, you're, you're just, you kind of are where you are when you, when you're running those mains, unless somebody makes a, a big mistake or leaves a big door open for you. But yeah, I, I think I think in general, I think sure X Ray still had a little bit of an advantage with the track. Um, they also, I don't know much about their cars, like to look at them and determine how much are different. But they were telling me that, or people were telling me that they had like kind of a new two wheel drive buggy, like okay. more new more new parts than normal. Okay, and then their four wheel, they had new parts too. And they were actually finishing the four wheel while the race was going on in two wheel. So like, <laughs> wow. in like in their building, they were like machining the chassis. They oh were my like, God. Yeah. They were like making the shock towers. And I guess at some point, this is what somebody told me that they came out and said, okay, we got the chassis ready and guys went to bolt up the chassis and they were like, Oh, these holes are in the wrong spot. And oh. then they had to they had to remake the chassis again or something. I don't know. Oh, it was <clears throat> that's what I was told. But right. they said they were they were making the parts while we were racing two wheel drive. They were making the four wheel parts. Wow, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, I mean we cut some things pretty close over the years and shipping things in next day and um, but uh, <laughs> doing a car kit. <laughs> but yeah, but you know a new car and you're still making it as the the event is going is cutting it pretty close. Wow. Uh, even, even for us, that's cutting it pretty close. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn. Isn't that something? Jeez. <clears throat> yeah. And it's tough to always make the right call because you know, you the stuff you've been running is working well, but, But in today's day, it makes sense for them to try to make uh, a car update or new car, or new parts for that event because they have a good chance of winning it, which they won four wheel. Mm -hmm. And um, and and now you have something to sell, right? So the race is over. You can say new oh, new car, yeah, new car won four wheel and buy it now. Bruno edition. Yeah, they can do that. And, and, but if it's a whole new car, you know, it's, that's your 2020 car, right? So you're coming up on the end of the year, which is normally when they release their cars. And yeah, now you can say, Hey, 2020 just won the world. So you're like, boom, ready. If you're one of their customers. So it's, it's nice. I, I think it is nice to release things at the world's because it's fun and it's exciting. Yeah. And if you pull off a victory or like they did or associated did, you got something, uh, something to sell. And mm -hmm. even for us and over the years, we've always made a lot of stuff for the worlds cause it's just fun and it adds something to it. Yeah. I used to love, uh, checking out all the new products and car action back then, you know, from the worlds nationals mm -hmm. or whatever stuff was always awesome. Yeah, I mean, Chile just shared a uh, an article today um, about the ninety one worlds uh, that Car Action did, and then, uh, but that yeah, that issue, the ninety one worlds and the eighty nine worlds were the two best issues I think there ever was of Car Action. They were phenomenal. Um, I can't remember who did them. I think Steve Pond might have did both. But, uh, yeah, I just remember that being uh, so amazing. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm checking it out now. Yeah, I think uh, Chili sent me some uh, files from those old magazines that I was able to go through. Um, the coverage was just freaking awesome back then. Couldn't wait to go to the newsstand and grab that. I was like, yeah. 
<laughs> if I didn't call the manufacturer to find out who won, I had to wait for the magazine to come out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's true. Yeah. And I remember the other issue I really liked is there was a, a monster truck shootout that car action did. And I remember being on vacation <clears throat> with my with my parents and going to – we were in the smallest town in Michigan, and we went to one of their newsstands and – and I was like, you know, I'm just like, oh, well, maybe they'll have a magazine here. And all the, you know, that new one is there already. And I'm like, oh, man. And that just was like, it like made my whole trip. Yeah, absolutely. Just went front to back with that, that magazine and uh, watched the monster truck shoot out. And man, it was great. We ready to call the champ? The champ is here. Yeah, let's call uh, Bruno up. <laughs> <laughs> is this Bruno? Bruno, hello. <laughs> All right, let's call up uh, Spencer Rivkin, the two-wheel drive world champ. Did it the Patriot way. The the uh, Tom Brady... Um, Car stand loved it. I can't wait to get mine. Mm-hmm. Should be coming uh, to you soon. Nice. I'm sure. Spencer's building a car right now. Oh, he is. Yeah. He's trying to get get ready. Kinda- Get ready for the J Concepts race. Yeah, that's this week. We got one going in Michigan. Yeah, we'll give him a call and see what the hell's up. Mm-hmm. Automated voice message. Oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Don't want to give a phone number out like I did one other time on a podcast. Oh, now that's Spencer calling me. Let's see if we got him on here. Yo. Hello. There he is. What's up, champ? What's going on? Spencer sent me to voicemail. He's like, ah, I don't want to talk to him right now. It was weird. Like, I saw my phone. I didn't hear it ring. And then I saw I had a missed call. Most people do that to me, Spencer. No worries. <laughs> right to voicemail. Right to voice. Jason does it to me all the time. <laughs> what I need to do is I need to save your phone number to uh, Mr. Patriot. Yes. <laughs> I can't believe how good of a season you guys are having. You and Kirby are having at the moment. Yeah, well, for, yeah. Well, there's three undefeated teams left: Patriots, Kansas Is Kirby, City, Kirby, uh, San Francisco, or Kansas City, San Fran. Yeah. Yep, Jimmy Z. Man, I tell you, the Kansas City Chiefs though scare me still. I I can't sleep at night. <laughs> I'm still worried. I was all right when we got Antonio Brown, and I thought things were going to go. You know, I was like, okay, we got him for five months at least. Let's let's try and be. I actually, I actually like that they are so um, extravagant playing on the field at the moment because <clears throat> it always seems to be a big game changer when playoff starts because there's a lot more on the line. They're not as risky. There, there, there's. There's nothing to, you know, for them, risking it right now is easy. But when it comes to the playoffs, it seems like the Kansas City Chiefs just they play much more, uh, more, more safe, which kills them against the Patriots. Because, That's true. So. Choke. Well, it's, so, yeah, Andy Reid, he he has a tendency to choke in the playoffs. But at the end of the day, <laughs> Bill Belichick's played against Andy Reid every single year. It's like, when is the year that they're going to get us? I know. I'm, I'm scared to death this year, this year because, <coughs> I, I don't know, I'm just, you know, I was praying that they would lose against Detroit. 
on yeah. Sunday. I mean, that was so close. Detroit should have had that. You know, I just want like a couple losses before they get to us, but I don't see it happening. Looking at their schedule, I think they might run the table. I, I think they. I think it's better for us if they if they dominate <laughs> because them winning all these games makes it for them that they're doing everything fine. And if they're losing, then that means they have a lot to improve on. I think it's more dangerous if they lose a couple games. Yeah. Okay. Me personally. Uh, I don't know, Jason. Like I, I can't sleep. Seriously. I can't sleep sometimes thinking about it. <laughs> I, I, it's just, <laughs> what, the, like, the I'm so invested. What, I'm so invested in it. And it's like, you're like 100% like that meme with the girls rolled to one side and the guys rolled to the other. <laughs> and, and, and and the girl's like, he must be thinking about other girls. Yeah, and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, can't Mahomes just get hurt, please? <laughs> Jero, have you been watching? Oh, God. No. No. <laughs> I don't. I don't need to. I got these guys in the chat who just they keep me updated what's going on. Pretty much twenty four seven. Yeah. Oh, it's twenty. It's like twenty four seven news network in there. <laughs> if there's a Twitter quote that comes out, it gets shared <laughs> with video. <laughs> with video, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <sighs> oh. It's brutal. I mean, we're four zero, but it's you know. I don't know. I just don't feel comfortable. The offense you scares me. You Brady and Belichick or what? Jeez. No, I'm not doubting them. I just, offensively, I just don't think, I don't know what's going on there. Our off- offensive line's hurting. Uh, hopefully yeah, 16, when the, 16 points, man. That's not cutting it. Well, you know, we're, we're banged up. Edelman's banged up. He couldn't, do, he couldn't do much at all on Sunday. And Josh Gordon just didn't do anything. I mean, as far as getting separation or make, you know creating his own plays, this it's, is all played out. I'm hoping for, it's yeah. Trust me, it's all played out because these guys that are not getting open, they're hurt. I mean, realistically, they can't just play all their cards in these first freaking five yeah, games. Absolutely, that's what I got to keep telling myself. <laughs> I mean, I'm taking Nyquil so I can sleep. It's, it's uh, I said after the Super Bowl, I'm like, oh, we got six. I'm fine now. Now anything else is just a bonus. And I was just like, yeah, we'll go into the next season and relax a little. Now I'm just like, okay, I want seven. I just want seven to get to seven first, and just then bail out, you know, and be like, okay, cool. You guys can you're do it. You're not gonna be happy. You're not gonna be happy with that. <laughs> as soon as you win seven, you'll be like, you know what? Let's let's let's, <laughs> let's try and widen the gap. <laughs> Go yeah, for it's, like, it's like Spencer after winning this RC race. This, I'm sure before this, he's like, yeah, let me just let me win this race at the X-ray track and I'll be fine. And then when it's over, he's like, you know what? Where's the world's next in two years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Well, really, what I was thinking is like, all right, let's go get four rail. But yeah, you know what? That's when a- I went back and watched the video, um uh, of some some of the four wheel is that one definitely kind of unraveled a little. Um, it, it seemed like man, you got off to such a great start in four wheel, and it was like no big deal. Uh, you ran that first run; it was only a couple tenths behind Bruno. It was like here we go again. You know, the stuff looks good, and you know, doesn't even look like he's pushing it yet. And then all of a sudden, it's like rounds of qualifying were going by. You needed that one other run to get inside the top five and it just wasn't as smooth. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely not easy. They don't call it easy, but I mean, yeah, it was, it was definitely um, disappointing considering the points that I had the other, you know, I think I was, I had a, a two, a four and a 14 for points. Yeah. That's like, it's like, it's like, you might as well just make a meme and say hashtag rookie. <laughs> this is the main with a two and a four. <laughs> yeah. When I came off yeah. that driver's stand after the last qualifier and it was like, you know, that was like the last chance to like really bump into the top, top five for starting in the main. Prince, like he calculated, he's like, yeah, you're in the main. And he's like, you're starting eighth. And I said, man, I don't even deserve to be in the main. 
<clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, from your perspective, I mean, obviously you deserve to be in the main, but from your perspective, you're like, man, I had two rounds of qualifying and why didn't I run better than you did, right? Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, uh, realistically, considering that, you know, I was thinking that the car could have been a little bit better, but I could have drove better and savaged a seven or a six. But I mean, that really only would have moved me up to like six, six place on the grid. But yeah, I mean, you have to have you have to have a TQ, some TQs or some twos and threes to really to really pull some damage in the finals. I remember the times that I made the main at the Worlds. I remember having like, you know, I had like a three and like a four. And, you know, I had these scores like that. And then in the end, I still qualified seventh. I was like, I'm like, God, what the hell do you have to do to TQ this damn thing? <laughs> I'm like, it's like, man, you got to win every every freaking round to TQ this damn thing. You yeah. know, in, your, in my in my mind, I'm like, God, I'm running good enough. I should be in the top three. And you look at the results, and you're like, God, seventh, jeez. <laughs> but yeah, it was like it was it was really weird being in my perspective on the two wheel drive side because you know I was in the B heat. And, you know, you get down with your run. Sometimes you remember how you did, you know, speculating the, the full run. Yeah, man, I didn't mm-hmm. make any mistakes. I did all this stuff and printed on a, a pretty fast pace. And then you watch, like, the, you know, the next heat up, which was AKA the, the, the A heat. And you're watching Bruno, Ty, Marn, Kovovic, Mayfield. And a lot of them were having pretty flawless runs, mm-hmm. to say the least. And you know, those times that I were that, that those four rounds that I TQ'd, I'm like, man, these guys got to be freaking killing my pace. These guys look good out there. Yeah. And you go look at the time, you're like, well, you know, Spencer TQ'd by two tenths over Bruno, or Bruno T- TQ'd by you know two tenths over Spencer. You know what I mean? Well, that's when you realize you're actually going fast. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I just didn't run a clean run. I actually was going fast because these guys aren't beating me. <laughs> and then you're watching them while you're turn marshal and going, oh, I, was oh, dude, oh, oh. I was like, I was like <laughs> on my tippy toes. I'm like, I'm like shaking my neck, like oh, crash there or something. <laughs> yeah, there's there's nothing like the feeling of when you have to run towards your competition to turn marshal them, and you're just like you're still putting in the effort, but in the side of your head you're going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dude, you, you know, have no idea. Like, I saw like I saw Ty, I saw Ty freaking crash in one of the forward I runs. It was the first the first round too. I'm like, he crashed in front of me. I jolted. I'm like, haha, sucker, you ain't beating me. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Because uh, at the end of the day, you have you you can be on a blistering time, and you crash once. I mean, you're not you're not going to be in the top five. Yeah, it's that as far as the top five run, it's over. Yeah, I mean that's just how close the competition is, which is badass, really. Well, it just shows you how good you have to be to be at that level. Um, not only do you have to be fast, uh, you know, Thomas and I were talking about it. and You can't just go out there and drive around and not crash and get a top three run. You actually have to be fast and not crash to get a top three run. Yeah. If you just run, if you run good, like you're kind of a pro driver and you run good and not crash, but not great. It's like a, it's like a top 12 or 13. Like mm-hmm. that's what you're going to get. You're going to get like a 12 or a 13. Um, but then to be fast and not crash, then you can get in the top three. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, we're talking about Spencer. This is the way the timing worked out. This is actually the 200th episode. Wow. Are we going really? with 200 then? Yeah. Okay. We're, we got to go with 200. All right. 200. This is episode 200. <laughs> I thought about doing like 199 and a third, but we'll, we'll make this 200. 
you gotta you have the chance. One ninety nine would be good because that's when Brady got dra- that was Brady's draft number, but I'll take two hundred. Yeah, we gotta do two hundred for the champ. <laughs> the champ. It's like the NFL's hundredth anniversary. Absolutely. What is it? Their hundredth anniversary? Yeah. Yep. This year. Yeah, the the hats and like their shirts and stuff look really, really awesome. Yeah, the logo. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys get new? Did you get stocked up on new memorabilia yet? Oh, sure. I'll take some pictures and send it through um, chat for you, Jason. Hold on. Yeah, I, I got to see what's going on here. All right, I'll be right back. <laughs> oh, this is a go away thing. Yeah, I got to run downstairs to get my hats and <laughs> shirts. And All right, you got a box? <laughs> Do you got to put it in a box? I'll just send you photos of the hats and stuff. All right, be right back. Yeah, I, di- I didn't get any of that stuff quite yet. I Not just got I, I, I just got the new um, crucial catch hat for the uh, Cancer Awareness Month October here, and, and a hoodie. Yeah, I saw that trip you went on with Carrie, man. You were decked out in your gear. But did, did you notice I did have J Concept shirt on, though? You did. You had a J Concept shirt. You'd wear your Patriots hat, then throw your hoodie over it. Yeah. yeah I, was, can always, I, I can count on you and Kirby to represent us. That's there. right. We rep. J Concepts, man. And Spencer Rifkin. I never did get my Spencer Rifkin shirt, though. Neither did he. You know what's, you know what's funny is, <laughs> Neither did surprisingly, <laughs> surprisingly, um, uh, a lot of people that I actually still see all the messages from when I won my first Worlds are uh-huh. asking mm-hmm. for the second shirt, but I don't think I'm going to do another shirt. I actually, we we I put on one of our graphic projects was to um, kind of make a, a shirt, um, a Spencer kind of shirt, but at the very minimum, I was going to do one of the crew ones, you know, like I have that Mayfield crew shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to do us do a Spencer crew shirt and I'll get you one. Cause I know you'll wear it. Heck yeah. I get that stuff for, for Mayfield. And he's just like, that's cool. <laughs> he he uses it as a as a rag for when he goes to the dunes. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. awesome. Hey, this this material freaking soaks up oil off my can. I'm really nice. She's like, this is, I get the fenders real clean with this shirt. All right, I'll be right back. <clears throat> yeah. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about Spencer as your kind of your um, you know where we we did leave off on the other uh, podcast that you did uh, after the world's warm up. We talked about how you guys did there, and then kind of going home and kind of getting your ducks in a row, and then coming back uh, to the actual race itself. Uh, you know, kind of talk about what it was like to go home, and then kind of think about what you wanted to do going back the next time. Yeah. I mean, the, obviously I kind of uh, forgot about, we did that podcast after the warm up. I'm sure some of the things I said was probably pretty negative on that event. But, of course. Yeah. Um, but you know, we talked about that a little bit before you came on. I told everybody that I said, look, I said, X-Ray still had an advantage on that track. It wasn't that they didn't have an advantage. Um, but I feel like the, the people that still did their homework and did their work and they were able to come and race and be competitive. Um, and, 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 and actually, and then obviously guys like you, and David A first and second, uh, you know, in the end. And, um, but I still feel they had the advantage having that mm-hmm. race at your track, uh, which is natural. But the part that I guess um, it surprised me, but it didn't, that there's still some guys, this is what Gotti and I talked about earlier. There's some guys you just can't deny, um, can, even if, they haven't been been there before. They're able to put it together and run well. Uh, you know, like David A and Mayfield and these guys, they still run well, but they weren't at any, I'm not sure at any point during the race for Mayfield that I feel like he was going to win it. 
Um, I felt like he was getting quicker and getting better, but I never felt like he was at the level like he was going to win it, like had that kind of confidence and was rolling. Mm -hmm. Um, And and I think not doing the extra practice or the (laughs) warm-up was probably part of the difference. You know, that he could have went from a guy that maybe would have qualified in the top three, maybe could have been third or fourth qualifier or something. And then, a little better shot at it, but not doing the warm up, not doing the extra practice, like the interview we did with Bruno that he, you know, he basically said, Hey, people could have practiced after the warm up like we did. Yeah. It was open. Yeah. And uh, he was right. And uh, these guys chose not to do it. And in the end you get fifth or ninth for that <laughs> basically is what it comes down to. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, I did watch Bruno's interview and you know, he was like, you know, you could have came to the warm up. Spencer and Dustin came for the warm up and, Obviously, the work paid off, um, but it could have easily gone the other way, too. Of course, yeah. I mean, what was that? Was it the first uh, – the the, fir- the the day we started two-wheel qualifying and we ran that round of qualifying, which determined where you started mm-hmm. in, in the very first round. I want to say the X-ray guys went one, two, and three in the A heat. And we were kind of like, oh, God, here we go. And then yeah. qual- and we started qualifying, and then, boom, you were right there. and Some other guys were right there. It was like there was a guy every round that kind of gave you hope that this isn't going to be a landslide. Like, this is going to happen for somebody. Yeah, it was definitely, I mean, you know as well, probably better than anybody, uh, just how quick – the the storyline can change um <laughs> yeah when when things are looking so good for you can end up being looking so bad at the same time not that they were looking bad for x-ray it was just like all right well it looks like there's going to be a challenge here and not just a an easy win Um, yeah, and I, and I think where that happened, the transition was after the very first round of qualifying, you were a couple tenths behind Bruno, and I think it was like, all right, this is exciting. Every, you know, somebody's competitive with the X-ray drivers. And then the next round you came back and got the TQ, I believe, and then it was like, wait a second, this can happen for somebody else. Yeah. And, and that was kind of when it changed. And then you got rolling. You got those couple more TQs in a row, and then it was like, well, you know, now it's not somebody else can do it. Now somebody else is going to be starting on the pole. (laughs) Yeah, definitely um, the storyline changed fast. Uh, But, you know, it was really weird at the same time. um, Well, I wouldn't say weird, but just definitely different that this the Behe guys, I mean, me. Davide and we'll call them orange wheels. We're all in the B heat and we were really running one, two and three the whole time. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, um, I thought that was definitely cool. It's pretty cool to see because I mean, the guys in the A heat are probably thinking, Oh, you know, like they're not probably really watching us. They're not really concerned because, you know, Typically, is this, when you're in, are you are you using your Makita? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. I'm building some dips for the carpet race in two weeks. Well, anyways, yeah, when you're in the A heat and you're watching like the B heat right before, you're not really watching them because you're like, oh, you know, you're not really sure if they're the fat, you know, who's going fast or whatnot. Because you're like, you know, I'm in the A heat, I'm going to go fast, I'm going to probably beat these guys, no worries, and then end up turning out to where it was the complete opposite. And that was really the, the strange part. Um, I mean, I was watching, I watched, um, I watched every single minute of that race online when I got back home and not once did I think my car and the way I was driving was looking, did look at my, at my best throughout qualifying. I, I actually thought Considering that the first AMA number one and two 
was slightly on the sloppier side. I thought I looked so much more comfortable and confident in those mains than I did in the qualifying. Mm-hmm. Um, which you can just tell by just like the natural, like more times on the track was a factor too. But I mean, I, I didn't think in the qualifying, my stuff looked at all that rad, to be honest. I mean, I thought, um, you know, orange wheels and David is car. They were driving really well too. They were. Well, like you said, you guys battled it out in five rounds of qualifying and then in the mains, you guys finished one, two, and three, and you came out of the B heat. Yeah. Pretty impressive. Yeah, that is pretty pretty nuts. So it was... Uh, what, what didn't... What you didn't know at the time, because none of us have time machines, is... Well... Says you. Yeah, theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> um, that when you're watching those qualifiers and you and Devide and Yasuki were running, you're just like, you're watching you guys and you're doing, checking the laps and you're like, God, these guys are close. And it's like, man, one of these guys, it's like one of these guys could beat Spencer in this qualifier. You know, they're that fast. And then, yeah. And, and while you're watching it or while I'm watching it, I'm thinking, oh, this probably isn't that good because, I mean, it's like you kind of have to win the B heat, you think, right? Yeah. But then you watch the A heat and you're like, man, all these guys, it's the three guys from the B heat that are in contention for the TQ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, definitely strange. Yeah, it was very strange. <clears throat> Yeah, like we're I'm do I'm doing the video and I'm like looking back, you know, like I'll video the cars a couple laps and I turn around and video the monitor and you're looking at the pace and you're like, ah, oh, these guys aren't all that hot. You know, usually like if you're at a some other race and you there's a A heat and a B heat, usually that yeah. guy takes off in the A heat and there's pace comes up on the monitor like after two or three mm-hmm. laps and he's like he's like eight seconds faster than the guy in the B heat. Yeah. And yeah, like, oh, I mean that's what guy's... that's what I was thinking. But that also, you know, is the difference between the worlds and the nationals. You know, the nationals yeah. there's you know, it's the competition is is very, very deep. But, I mean, I think you know, um, at the Worlds, think, there's guys in in the B and C qualifier that could TQ. Yeah. I think it was also cool that looking at stats, you know, in hindsight, but the, I mean, Davide won the Euros in two-wheel drive. Um, <laughs> and, you know, obviously uh, the result I had at the Nationals winning the two-wheel drive. I mean, it just, I mean, that's a cool stat that, you know, you're battling out at the world championship with the two nationals um, in America and in, and in Europe, really. Well, yeah, basically what you're saying, right? You still there? Yeah, I'm here. You hear us, Jason? I think Jason... Jason butted out. I think he hit mute. Hold on. Let me message him. Jason. Sorry. My uh, headphone went dead. Uh oh. I, I switched out the battery. <laughs> so, yeah, I, what you're saying is, is, yeah, you won the USA Nationals. Um, Angaro won the Euros. And then Yasuki won the Japanese Nationals. Yeah. And then you got one, two, and three at the Worlds. <laughs> yeah, a that's lot of pretty weird, crazy. A lot of weird, uh, a lot of weird things there. Yep. Very interesting. So yeah, we were talking about 
you prepping at home, getting ready for the for the worlds, and we kind of got sidetracked because we got on. We had to explain that um, you know the worlds ended up being awesome. Uh, I'm sending over the photos of my uh, gear there, Jason. I created a oh. group chat. Oh, great! I see all of them. They're <laughs> You have a lot. Yeah, I got a lot more than that, but this is the newest stuff. So this guy's like me and my Bigfoot shirts. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not as bad. No. no. You know, when I was in junior high, mm-hmm. see, when I was a kid in elementary school, I used to wear the same kind of shirts every day. Like I have my Bigfoot shirt and I have my Chuck Norris shirt. I wear every day. <laughs> I, I got I got into junior high. Save some and, for the rest of us, Jason. <laughs> well, that was, that's the point I'm getting to. <laughs> so I get I get into junior oh, high. I get, into, <laughs> I, I, I get into junior high, and I'm still wearing my big foot and my Chuck Norris shirts, right? And I I remember I remember this girl telling me she's like, "Don't you have anything?" Other than Bigfoot shirt. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, uh, You're like, so, no. And I'm like, I go, they're all different, though. <laughs> I'm like, it's not the same. It's not the same Bigfoot shirt. It is a different one every day. <laughs> so it was like, I was trying to explain, like, look, they are different shirts. I'm not wearing the same shirt every day. Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, I had to go buy some new shirts and it, it, it wasn't working in junior high anymore. <laughs> I, I couldn't, I couldn't rationalize it to the, to the girls in junior high. Yeah. <laughs> so what'd you go to then? Whatever was the cool thing at the time. The, yeah. Bulls. What was it? Got, no, gotcha. Jimmy Z. All right. You had all that stuff, right? Uh, probably about, like Ruka. Do you have that stuff back then, or no, no, that, God, that, no. that would be like, but that Maybe would like be like 2015. That's the equivalent of what <laughs> yeah. of what I bought. Yeah, Jason bought Bugle Boy. No. <laughs> hey, what's that? Uh, this is gonna be funny. This could be completely. Um, wrong but on uh, wolf of wall street there's that uh, they talk about these shoes with like the the cartoon googly eyes and they're these uh i'm gonna look it up right now but since you're in a shoe fashion back in the day <clears throat> you, you guys may have uh worn them so do they talk does he talk about them in the show yeah but i don't think they're real let me see. I had, you know, what's funny is I had Reeboks and Air Jordans back then too. Mm. Steve Madden is the. Is oh the well, character. that's that's after us. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was after us. <clears throat> like, what was? Uh, a hot thing, like I think in our age group was, um, you know, like Reebok was big, and then yeah, the, the, the pump, then the yeah, ni- or, uh, and then Jordans. Well, Reebok pumps, then Jordans, that was big, and I remember the Bo Jackson shoes were huge. Oh had yeah, those, yep. the Bows. We'll have to show Spencer that commercial on YouTube. The, the bow nose that was so big. Uh, but yeah, that's what was kind of hot back then. It's like even if you watch Seinfeld, you know that TV show that was running in the '90s. I mean, he's wearing Air Jordans half the time, and yeah, they had a. And then it got into the boots. 
like in like during the grunge era, like 94, 95, 96, you got, I remember I had, uh, you kind of started getting some boots again. Not me. You didn't get boots? No. You didn't get uh, Doc Martens? No, I did not. That was big, man. I went through a little uh, clothing fashion change. When I was like seven or eight, I loved wearing like tuxedos. (laughs) What? (laughs) Yeah, I swear to God. Tuxedos? Yeah, like, but like, it was all white tuxedos. It's like white shoes and everything. It's like it's like the Dumb and Dumbers. <laughs> all right, yeah, all I orange. Swear. All right, send pics. I'll I'll have to find one. I had my spiky hair with my sunglasses on. Oh, that's Hate, epic. Haters will say it's Photoshop. <laughs> oh, that you got to send a pic. That's got to go with the episode. The- um, <clears throat> I gotta send the picture of the one I was trying to dress up like Commando. Oh my god! Did you have the black face paint on? I did. <laughs> oh, this is, wait a minute! I think you did send this through chat once. I did. Maybe not. <clears throat> Won't be able to find it now, but uh, I thought you did. You were dressing up for Halloween, right? Yeah, I think you did. It's like no. The truth is, when I went, I left. I left the Bigfoot shirts and the Chuck Norris shirts at home, and then I just dressed like Commando. <laughs> <laughs> You're like I eat green rays for breakfast, <laughs> and I'm very hungry. <laughs> Where are you at, ladies? Yeah. Jeez, leave some for the rest of us, Jason. Wow. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, you know what? Uh, it was, uh, episode it was a 200. Good time, but yep. yeah. yeah, it was a good time. It was a good time. And you, you could get away with so much in elementary school. That's what was so awesome. If Spencer wanted to wear a white tuxedo, he could. If I wanted to wear. Uh, if, if I wanted to wear a Bigfoot shirt every day, I could. That's what was. <laughs> That's what was cool about being in elementary school. But then <sighs> when it came time to where you had to be cool, it just wasn't yeah, about you, being a kid. You wear that stuff. If I wear that white tux now, <laughs> I mean, I think the principal would kick you out. Yeah. <laughs> they would think you're up to something. Mm. Yeah, it's just it's so fun and innocent up to a certain age. And then people then the kids get nasty. <sighs> It's just not as much fun anymore. I went to Catholic school, so I had to wear uh, I had to wear ties. I had to dress up for school. Dang. Yeah, until I got to junior high. Then I'd rock the uh, you know jeans t shirt and uh, James Worthy's. Yeah, you said you you wore a Lakers shirt almost every day, right? Yeah, that and then when uh, that and Trinity shirts. I was a big you know <laughs> big Trinity fan back then. Joel Johnson. The Magic Motorsports shirt, dude. I had like four of those, and I wore them like every day. <laughs> you know, and it's cool. It's cool that you're able to do that. Yeah, I'm not sure they do that today, right? Nobody buys apparel. Or I shouldn't say nobody, time. but uh, I don't think they, I don't think they're into it like we used to be. Well, what was big back then is, I don't know if Spencer's ever seen this, was the cartoon shirts of the whole team. Like, now they would have that, the whole Patriots team. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're talking. Would would be, yeah, yeah, would be cartoonized on the front of the shirt. And they're actually really cool looking. Yeah. Picture of a dinosaur. Oh, yeah, that was on the Trinity shirts. The dinosaur with the Ferrari. Yeah, I had that shirt. I thought that shirt was so cool looking back then. And I would. Cool. I, yeah. I, even when I raced for Trinity, I didn't want to wear Trinity shirts. <laughs> I, I, I just, I never liked any of their shirts. <laughs> Magic Motorsport shirt? That was really cool looking. No, I couldn't. It said do designed it. by Joel Magic Johnson. I thought that was so awesome. <laughs> I was like, yeah, Joel Johnson. 
Spencer's like, what does he have? Only two world titles, too? <laughs> John Johnson. Is that the guy that, the, that they posted a video with him with that Kyosho car? That's it? Yep. Is that the guy? Yep. <laughs> He's uh, that one guy. The legend. <clears throat> So, continue uh, talking about the... Uh, <laughs> back onto the worlds. <laughs> back to the worlds. Uh, what? Oh, you know what? We can continue on the clothing path, if you like, and Uh-oh. talk about Spencer's world's clothing. Oh. He, he was... Uh, he he went for the sweatpants. The s- sweatpants are world champions right now. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we went to there for the warm-up. And I was wearing my traditional shorts. Main day, wore the red shorts. And to be honest with you, it just wasn't working out. Hmm. And <laughs> Bruno and Martin, and even even the owner, um, your eye, he was wearing sweatpants. Hmm. And you know what? I said... You said, Dad, go get me some sweatpants. Kind of cold. Yeah, I, I had those things Amazon primed over. <laughs> and I made it happen and brought like four or five pairs of sweatpants. And yeah, I mean, at that point, I didn't even care what I look, what you look like. I was just like, you know, they're pretty comfortable. It's a little chilly out. And you kind of blend in with the crowd. You don't look like you're foreign or anything to them. And Huh. You got treated. You, I got treated way better at the food stand. Once you put the sweatpants on, yeah. <laughs> wow, this is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? They're not like the traditional like champion sweatpants. Like he's got like no. the he's got like the cool guy sweatpants, which he it, it looks good on him. You know what I mean? Like it it looks right. Okay. It's like he's not like coming in with a with the champion sweats, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah, like he just rolled out of bed with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are like the designer sweatpants. Oh man, not like George Costanza when he went to sweatpants. Yeah, that means the, the, your life is over. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah, look you good, can't... play good, look yeah. good, play good. Yeah. Or look good, feel good, play good. Is that how, that's how it is? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's the thing is I remember when, you know, when I would go to race the worlds, it's the one race I can think of that you always like, you know, it's like you get your hair cut, you get some new clothes, you get new shoes, like you really gear up. Hmm. And um, I mean, that's how it always was when I was racing the races. And it's just that one race that you just – you got to go through the list and you got to, you got to do it all. You know, I did that for my first worlds in Japan. And then I like really did it for in China. Mm-hmm. Like I got a pit board, a pit mat, shoes, different clothes. I even used a new like radio for my car, a fresh radio. Like, Oh, it's blinging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sucked. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally did the least for this world's as far as just and you like wore the being... you wore sweatpants. That means like when you wear sweatpants, like said on Seinfeld, you've given up on life. So yeah, I bet you other like, racers are like, oh geez, Spencer. Oh man, Spencer, are we gonna have to talk to him? He must have cashed it in already. <laughs> <laughs> Sweatpants? Yeah, Mayfield was giving him some stuff. Oh, was he? Well, the first I, the, the first thing I remember after Spencer won, <clears throat> I remember Mayfield going, now don't think you should wear sweatpants at every race from now on. <laughs> yeah, he did say that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's just some of the inside stuff well, that happens. That's some, of the, some of the things that, back to doing it like getting some fresh shoes clothes maybe some new like rc gear when you go to these big races you kind of forget about what's really important and (laughs) and that's pretty easy to do nowadays because there's so much stuff you can do 
as far as yeah, like personalizing you get, things. Yeah, you get caught up in the novelty of running a race that is about more show than go, and it's really more about go than show. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's like um, you know, I don't know how many times I've been to races with Mayfield where it's like I'm wanting to put new bodies on his cars and stuff and he's just like ah this is fine and you know he's just out there hauling ass with his beat up freaking body and I'm just like well you know what this works for him I guess it's like yeah whatever (laughs) hey there's one thing that you did buy Spencer that has me interested Um, I was looking at this also is the DGI pocket cam how do you like that thing it is awesome. Sweet. It is um, pretty bad to the bone. I mean, I got home. Yeah. I had like three and a half hours of footage. And I was going to make a long, like a, like a, the goal was to do a vlog of the event, right. regardless of, of how I did. And then I decided as I was making it, that this was going to take way too long. And not to mention, uh, Jason did, did his stuff. And, um, you know, I kind of, I did a, uh, uh, corporate decision to (laughs) do a three minute vlog of a short, quick recap, recap of some of the things behind the scenes that, I would I witnessed and of like some of the trophy presentation, me walking up to the trophy girl, um, stuff like that. Yeah. That um was cool for me and I'm sure people enjoyed it and it's on my YouTube and it's actually one of my best videos that I posted as far as viewers. And um when I was making that and finished it, I thought, you know, how cool would it be to do a video like this at every race I go to of like some behind the scenes, maybe a little bit at dinner, the trophy presentation, and then back on the flight back home. And then oh, absolutely. The so like, I think um, I'm going to just start, start a series of this, the videos that I go to and um, just use that as a, you know, on the road with Spencer Rifkin kind of thing. Oh man, they'll love that. And, um, and, you know, I wish it, I, I, I had so much more film to use. Obviously I told you I had three and a half hours and I made a three minute and two second video, but, <laughs> and, and it really took doing, me probably, the, you really did the most. <laughs> <laughs> it really, uh, it really took me a couple hours to make it. Cause I was trying to get, well, it was really bugging me. Cause I, the way that I like to see how things roll out, like I was trying to get the audio to match, like the different clips of how it was being shown and you kind of get the vibe of how the video is going. That's kind of important to me and how it, how it all looks and yeah. watching, you know, as I'm making a video, I'm searching up on YouTube, how to do this as I'm trying to make my video and that makes it longer. <sighs> yep. Yeah. I mean, it was, it really took me a, a, a good half the day to, kind of figure out how I wanted to implement the video. And then it took me a three out three hours to really just get it done. Yeah. That's, you that, know what? Mm-hmm. I actually like it. It doesn't bother me one bit. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's behind the scenes stuff. That's really cool to do. Yeah. I mean, obviously the JC videos that were posted were, you know, awesome because like he, you know, Jason and his crew back at the shop, they got the, the content made it happen as the event's still going on. I mean, I'm not sure if he's going to be doing that for all the events we go to, but just because they're not that long. But, I mean, it really gives a visual for the people, especially for the events that are in the States, um, oh. that people aren't able to attend, but want, potentially would, would attend next year. They could see actually how it's ran and get a good insight on on how the how popular it is and the talk about the video, the talk about the event online. And um, I think it gets people to put the, that event on their calendar for next year. At least yeah. it tries to. That, that's what it does. Yeah. I think that's what it does is that people, people say, you know what, this looks cool. I'm going to plan to do this. Yeah. And that's the whole, 
that was the goal on um, my little short videos. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to make it as long as Jason's and because it's his event and all this stuff. But, you know, it, the videos that I'm, I'm making are my <clears throat> perspective of how things went. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much the goal. Now, I haven't had – I just started doing it. So if I'm having a bad event, you know, then I might not do it. But no. <laughs> Well, no, that's that's the challenge, you know. That's that's, <clears throat> you know, um, there's two things that are difficult for me to do, is um, <clears throat> to videotape the races while while it's going on because I want to watch with my eyes, not through the camera, mm-hmm. and um, and it's also tough to videotape people and ask them questions and talk about a race <clears throat> that's difficult while it's going on not knowing <clears throat> what the end result is going to be because like you said you're not going to win all of these events and you're not going to be able to it's not going to be the perfect ending every time yeah so so um <clears throat> that is difficult for me to film knowing that that's a possibility. And, um, and it's also difficult for me to film races that I want to watch through my eyes, not through the camera. Mm -hmm. And, but I just, at this race, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. I just got to stick to it because people want to see it. And, you know, I just kind of stuck to my guns and I was like, you know what? I got to record the start of this main. Like I can't watch it with my eyes, you know, I got to watch it through the camera. And, um, and I, I just tried to stick to it and, and it's difficult because it's hard to walk up to people and talk to them about their race when they're not doing well. Cause I've been in that position and, yeah. um, and I don't want them to feel that, um, you know, they could certainly say, you know what? I don't want to talk about it. That's fine. You know what I mean? Like, I'm okay with that. But the fact that they do talk about it, whether they do well or not, I think really shows that they're somewhat mature about what's going on. And they can they can accept the good and the bad. And that's important. It's hard. It would be hard for me to do interviews when I was super into – racing my races to explain doing good and doing bad it's t- it's hard <clears throat> but that's what people want to see people want to see the human side of it where it's just not the the machine you know the person that they watch that's a machine that doesn't um you know, like when you and Mayfield are running the Truggy main this year at the nationals and you guys are you know you finish a second apart after 45 minutes and you guys don't really make any mistakes. They just think you guys are machines, but it's like that. They like to see the other side of it too, where it's like, look, you know, Hey, I had a bad race or that qualifier didn't go as well as I thought it would. And I got to make changes. And that, I think that's the human that humanizes the situation a little bit to them. And they go, you know what? I can relate to not doing well out there. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you're like i don't relate they're like i don't relate so well to winning the worlds what i relate to is not winning the worlds <laughs> but it, it's nice because it's like watching um you know and obviously the guy Corey from canada always does an awesome videos um and the stuff that we were doing i'm by no means trying to have the type of footage that he has because um uh, uh, He's like committed to the nth degree and I'm just committed to having it on me. (laughs) But people do like when they can live through somebody during a weekend like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I had people asking me what kind of camera I use and I'm like, and Rich was like, he's like, I think this is like an eight year old camcorder. Really? Yeah, that thing's definitely vintage. Yeah, the one I'm using, it's like an eight-year-old 
little camcorder. Wow. And the, re- the reason I use it is because I can put it in my pocket. And so, like, if I walk up to the track, I can put it in my pocket. And if I see something's kind of interesting, I can video a little. Then I can put it away. I can take it out. If somebody says, hey, set my car down, I can put it in my pocket. I can set their car down. Like, I can still kind of function. I don't have to walk around with this two-handed camera on a gimbal and, you know, kind of look like I'm from ESPN, you know. (laughs) We should check out the camera that uh, Spencer got. It's pretty cool. It's no, yeah. He, I, I ran like, it a little bit for him, and oh, cool. that thing is micro. Yeah, it's micro tiny. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, um, for you that are uh, for what you're doing, the uh, the zoom ups that you you get when the cars are on the track, the micro that what I have is probably not the best thing for what you're doing, but for you're doing like close-ups, then it's really good. But it seems like, you know, I was watching the videos that you posted a lot of, you know, there was a lot of good, um, on the track scenes that I probably wouldn't look as nice with the, with what I have considering that you can't really zoom. Okay. But I mean, the thing is bad to the bone. I mean, it's crazy how small it is and how good. I mean, it, it you can, uh, for videoing, uh, you can video at 1080p at 60 frames per second, which is better than a phone, but you can't zoom in. <clears throat> yeah. What, what's funny is when I have that camera, sometimes when I would go to the back of the track and I'd film from the back, uh, since that, that system that they use that, for scoring sucks so bad on your phone. Like you can't, I, you don't know what the scoring looks like from the back of the track. So I would you use the in. camera and I would zoom in on the monitors behind the oh, driver's wow. stand. <laughs> would it actually work? <laughs> yeah, I could see it. I'm like, Oh, Spencer's on a 522 pace. Sweet. Oh. You know, like, wow. And so, but at that zoom level, your zoom so tight that any little movement, like you're off the whole TV screen. So it's like, you have to hold the thing so still to actually see like yeah. what the time is, but it works. Like I could do it. Like I could, you know, I'd film some driving you guys on the driver's stand and then I'd zoom in on the scoring <laughs> behind there and like, okay, yeah. All right. Well, <clears throat> so that actually made it, kind of nice because you could figure out what was going on <clears throat> that track was so big that you could watch if you watch from the ground it's really you have to be really pretty keen on what the differences are between fast guys because when you just watch somebody you're like man this guy looks good and then you look up at their time and you're like oh this guy's on like an 05 pace you mm. know it's like that's not that great, you know. Wow. And then, like the fast guys come up, and they're like on the whole next lap pace, and and but watching when you're just standing there, the track is so big that it, you have to really be keyed into what what a fast guy looks like and what you know just normal fast looks like. <laughs> That's why the the scoring is so valuable. I actually like their scoring. Um, well, excuse me. I like the RCTV um, part. I yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I think that's a a debate out there whether people like the broadcast of RC Racing TV versus live RC. I think that's mm-hmm. been been building a little bit more the past several years. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Gotti always talks about he loves the RC Racing TV guys. Yeah. For sure. Um, and, and I like it too. I, I think it's good. Um, but we've been around live RC, uh, since, uh, the first event I think we did live was, uh, well, the first nationals we did live was like 2011 or 12. And before that we did some stuff live scoring, <clears throat> but so you, I think you're, you're kind of accustomed to, what that looks like and it being different is, is sometimes is 
to me is kind of refreshing, right? Like, um, well, they both do an amazing job. I yeah. mean, it's, it's unreal that we're able to sit at home and watch these things. <laughs> well, the, yeah. The, the other thing that's, that's interesting <clears throat> is on RC racing TV for the most part, it's always the same guy. Yeah. Um, calling the the races on uh, in live rc over the years sometimes it, you know it's changed multiple times so i think sometimes people have a favorite whether it's like oh i liked this guy or i liked that guy uh, so but it is it's nice that we're able to watch that stuff what's weird is the racers don't get to see it a lot uh, like, you know, Spencer and Mayfield and these guys, they don't get to see it a lot because they're always racing. Mm-hmm. So, and you hear I remember, from, like, your friends or family. Yeah, it's just, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, Mayfield didn't go to one of the races you guys went to, mm-hmm. and he said he was watching it on Live RC, and he was just like, like, he's like, I was into it, like, I forget what he was watching, like PMB or something like that. And he's, or if it was AMS or one of them, and he's just like, he's like yelling at the thing. He's like, why is these guys crashing? Like, (laughs) he's like, yeah, he's like, what are these guys doing? You know? And, and, uh, so it was funny because he kind of got that at home perspective. Yeah. That, you know, obviously you're normally in, in the game. So, it's, yeah, well, uh, when you're behind the difference you're for event, Spencer, the difference for you is you've watched so much RC video over the years. Um, when you weren't going to races and you were younger, all those worlds you've either watched live or rewatched. I don't know if I don't know anybody that's watched more RC racing on YouTube than probably you have. <laughs> yeah, multiple videos at a time. Yeah. I've seen them all. What is the one you I say you, you, you watch the North Carolina or something like that? You watch that one. You've watched that one quite a bit. Um, I watch the, the Finland worlds a lot. Um, a lot, a lot. And um, the Thailand worlds and Nitro. Um, yeah, I mean, we're pretty fortunate nowadays with people like you and these doing these videos. I mean, there wasn't this kind of content back, you know, 10 years ago, like behind the scenes, yeah. you know, when it was, and if it was, then it was like, it got a lot of views. Yeah. Um, and now it's like the, the pie has gone so much bigger a piece of the pie. So it's like, the, you, you not get a lot of views um, because there's like, Oh, I can watch it on, I can watch it live. <clears throat> you know, I don't need yeah. to go back and watch it again. You know, um, I've, I've been to so many of those worlds and I'm trying to think of ones that I went back and watched. Um, but for the most part, I've always felt like when I was there and I saw it live, I haven't went back and watched it. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's nitro races I've never seen the end of. Because as soon as as soon as Mayfield broke, I left the track. <laughs> um, you know the the worlds in North Carolina, the the one in uh, Thailand, um, basically all the ones where he was leading, and something happened. I've never seen the end of those races. <laughs> You're like, uh, who won again? I just remember being back in the pits in Thailand, and I'm like, Cody King won this race. It's just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Jeez. You know, like, I'm just thinking, I'm like, we had this guy covered. <laughs> yeah. You but, know, watching the, you maybe, you may remember this, but when Mayfield was battling with him the first three laps, and then they go through the long rhythm section, like the triple in and, and you know, double, double out. And then uh, Ryan and him, like, they, were, they like pretty much landed on each other, and then Ryan went flying. Mm-hmm. I remember that Thailand track just being—that's the track you're talking about, right? Yep. 
<clears throat> that track was nuts. Probably the coolest track to watch in person. Uh, I don't even know if the, the video or anything does it justice. Um, what an awesome track. It, it, it really was so difficult. And watching those guys with at that time and with the precision they were driving that track and how big it was and um, they had those little fences everywhere. <laughs> yeah, those and things the, look weird. Yeah, they made like those foot and a half tall little fences. They're all little metal fences that they painted like red and white and just amazing little details everywhere. And <clears throat> I remember Mayfield landing on the other side of the track once and he's like the term marshal's like not knowing which way he came from and he's like driving towards the lane he ran off of and he's like back flipping into the little fence. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that. <laughs> I just remember him like, no, I'm over here. And he would drive towards the fence and do a backflip off the fence. And the guy would finally be like, oh, okay, so you want to be over there and puts his car over there. It's like, like, dude, this is like a 12 second crash. Oh, my God. But uh, yeah. yeah, there was some being live at a lot of those events is uh, well, very, I've very amazing. I probably watched two days worth of film when I got back from the world. Wow. Yeah. Just kind of going back and watching. Could you watch your qualifiers or just watch the mains? Mm -hmm. I watched everything. I watched practice. But you know, you know, that's the thing that we don't, um, you know, Paul, Paul Wynn talks about it all the time. And I think Spencer's one that actually, has taken advantage of it over the years is watching video of yourself. Uh, it's something that I used to do all the time when I was young practicing is we would go videotape it and I'd bring it home. You know, we'd go practice on Saturday and then I'd watch the video at night while I'm working on my stuff. And then Sunday was our race and you'd come back and you're just like, okay, I'm like so ready for this. And, um, and over the years, you know, uh, you know, Paul's, I was, Paul's, I was convinced that none of these guys watch enough video. You know, he feels like they need to know a little more about what it looks like where they're driving and things and maybe watching somebody that's going faster than you at that time. And, uh, it is tough sometimes to me it's I, I've noticed I, I, I know Spencer has no problem watching I mean you watch the first main when you crashed at the top of the hill you know he's like after the A1 he's like back in the pits he's watching all right what did I do wrong here yeah he's like oh I hit the turn <laughs> <laughs> and um, a lot of people don't want to watch themselves making a mistake no. yeah yeah <clears throat> and yeah it's you have to accept it you do. And it's important um, to be able to watch it and critique and come back and be better. And if you can work that in part of your game, that's big. I mean, in all these sports, right, all they do is watch tape. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I'm yeah, sure I mean, Brady, um, Brady knows what he looks like playing probably more than anybody. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I uh, kind of took a lot of, you know, a lot of this footage watching from like these football players and a lot of, a lot of uh, like what the what Brady's doing, watching the, the film right after, you know, you get the pick six or pick six or interception. It's like a lot of people don't have the guts to watch themselves when they do that because they're like afraid of it or something. I don't know. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. I mean, literally it's like it hurts them so much to watch with their own eyes, what they did wrong. But mm -hmm. To me, I think that's how I accelerated so fast on picking up things, kind of getting um, further into these kind of races and being prepared for these kind of scenarios. <laughs> it's like, 
it helps. The the part that was always been wild to me about watching video of either yourself or um, other racers is, to me, it never looks as good on video as you remember it being in person. Uh, like I'm thinking when you're, you know, like you said, watching your car and qualifying and stuff, and you're like, oh, I thought it was like just kind of okay, but like watching it at the time, to me and. It, it it looks good, but I know what you mean going back and watching it later. I always thought like, you know, to myself, I'm like, God, I'm I'm really wide in that turn. <laughs> it's like I thought I was so dialed, you know, from the driver's stand and I'm like watching the video going, I could actually do a lot of better things here. But that's the reason you watch, right? Yeah. I mean the biggest thing what I like, um it's gonna sound kind of weird, but like when I was explaining to you earlier in the, in, in the po- in this podcast about like watching my car in the qualifying versus how I was driving in the mains, like I can feel when I was watching my car in the qualifier, like the energy of like, cause I can remember these, these like certain spots that I was hitting. And I re- I re- like, I remember like doing that turn. I remember double steering in that section that I could have been yeah. more fluid around. And I can watching the mains. I was like, I can just feel like the energy of how I was driving, and like you can see the confidence were so much higher than it was in the qualifying. And once you pick up those, you can see those key moments of your drivability, and you use that um, those same insights for when you watch these other videos. Like, you know, you can tell like. I watched film from, you know, Silver State this year, watching, you know, me running in like eighth or ninth or tenth place. It's like you can see this, clearly see that like it was just a struggle bus and it was just nothing was like it, everything looked agony to watch. I mean, there's times where it's difficult, like when you're doing well and then like a nitro you flame out and you're running back and forth or fifth. But you can see like, you know, the energy of how good you're still driving and hitting these marks. Mm-hmm. And then when you're doing bad, you can be like, all right, you know, you need to pick up this and this and that. Um, well, but, I mean, to I me, took a lot of, to me, what, lot what of happens, home. Mm-hmm. what I think is happening is you start timing up your memory to what's happening on video. And it's like over, you're starting to overlap your memory from the race and your lap with the with watching in real time on the video and you're and you're overlaying the two and that's why Mm. you start to get nervous to me when i watch videos of a result i already know what's going to happen i still get nervous oh yeah same here so to me what's (laughs) happening is i think you're overlaying how you felt in real time (laughs) with how it looks now, but you can't fight it. You you know what's going to happen, mm-hmm. but you're still overlaying those two things on top of each other, and you're it's like bringing it back to you again, and you and you can have those same similar feelings, um, and it's like at at the end you're all relieved all over again. You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> it's wild how that works. Yeah, I, I watched that AFC Championship game. Uh, Kansas City Patriots at the final drive in overtime. I watched that. I don't know how many times I've watched that. I'm serious. And every time I'm on the edge of my seat. And I know <laughs> what happens. Going, yeah. Yeah. You're just thinking, God, I hope this goes well. You're like, well, it does go well. I know, but still. I'm <laughs> I know. And I tell, I tell you that in my chat too, right? I'm like, oh, yeah, man. It's, <laughs> I'm watching this it over is. and I'm nervous. <laughs> um, but that's a really cool trait that happens with video. And it's really hard to. Um, it's really hard to sh- to explain. At the end of the day, a lot of getting better for me has been coming to watch these videos, of whether it's myself or whoever I'm watching, and it's made a pretty big difference. Well, what are you picking up when you watch these other guys? What, what are you trying to? Um. Well, when I. When I try to search for like strategies, well, I wouldn't say strategies, but uh, being in the right place at the right time, like I go back and watch a lot of races where like Tebow and like these are nitro specific races where like, you know, Tebow or Cav are running in fourth or fifth. 
in his like the guy or you know second or third or whatever, you know you know Mayfield mm-hmm. leading or whatever it may be, <clears throat> and staying in it and seeing how the pit stops end up and all this stuff, and you know one one little bobble or crash from the leader or flame out in the pits, you're like right back in the game, mm-hmm. and just seeing like these different um, how all these different scenarios could play out when you're at these races is just trying to always stay positive of the circumstances that you're in, regardless of where you're at right. on the track. Um, I mean, obviously when you're running in 10th and, you know, having some realistic expectations to happen, you know, you're not going to really get that, but um, I mean, that's really what it comes down to is just, Thinking that you're still in the game when when it's not looking like you're in the game. And when those occasions arise and you're like, well, I'm running third. Now I'm in second. I'm only one second away from the leader. But, you know, five minutes to go. Like, that's the kind of things that I look at. You know, that's... And I think, yeah, basically what he's saying is you can learn from other people's mistakes by watching a video. Um, you can see, you can watch things and go, wow, man, if this, this guy is really not that far away from, from him, they made a pit stop. He did this, he made a mistake, yeah. but then this guy, this guy crashed later. He could be right back there, but maybe he flipped out or had a bad moment or ruined the race for himself. And all of a sudden you're learning these things like, um, that, uh, you can apply to your own racing down the road. Yeah, right. You're running these scenarios through your head or you're watching them, and then all of a sudden yeah. you find yourself in this scenario. Yeah. And then you're like, well, I've been here before. You know, yeah, I, you're, or, you're like, you're like, dude, this guy could crash at any moment. I'm right back in the game. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, and then it's or, even like just it's just even like like this world race we went to, it's like wasn't really gonna be looking like we were gonna have really a shot. I mean, mm-hmm. realistically going in it's like i mean i was i literally no joke was you know i wrote down my goals of what i wanted to do at this race and it's like you know i'm expected to win from my companies that that support me but like my own personal goal was like all right if you can just make the main and you know make the main if you if you can if you can qualify in the top five that was like exceeding my expectations on seriously what i thought me of how i was gonna go at this world and i wrote the goals down considering their kind of service that we were running on knowing that you know haven't really had much time running on this kind of surface you know how the warm-up went and um and just like you know that's the kind of stuff that i that i was telling myself I mean, and it went even better than the, than planned, but it wasn't something like, you know, I was like flying to this race and I was thinking on the flight, like, you know, you have a, a 100% chance of winning. Like I was kind of giving myself some reasonable goals considering the lack of experience on the surface and the track that we were going to and... You know, like mm-hmm. that's kind of stuff that I was thinking. Um, so, and actually, we had a question that came in from a listener. Uh, when you came back from the world's warm up race, where did you go to practice on the most comparable surface? Because I, remember, I, I really didn't. No. Yeah, there was no practicing. Um, because remember, we got dirt samples. <laughs> yeah, we did. I actually have it right here. Um, hey, I gotta say something to Fred. You guys, talk for a minute. Nice. Honestly, it was really just um, when we got, when we came back from the world warm up. I mean, we had so many races, actual races we actually had to attend. Yeah, you didn't have much time. Yeah, there there really was no time. So that's pretty much that. Really, only practice we got. I mean, when I got my world's cars built and done the week before that we went to the left for the world i went to hobby action ran my my world's cars three or four battery packs and that was it 
That was uh, all she wrote for the world's preparation. I mean, granted, we actually came, we came in to the world with some some new stuff that we didn't have for the warm up. That some of the notes we took back for our engineering staff and our team, yeah, back at Associated. Um, and you know, it was like going into the world. We're like, all right, well, we ended here. You know, I think with the stuff we have now, we're going to be in the will be better than where we left off at the warm up, and um, using some of that positivity and data that we had. I mean, it was looking like you know, being in the top five would be would be um, would be great. Uh, the other question we had was, <clears throat> uh, what setup changes uh, did you make to the car um, to work well on that surface? Well, earlier on in practice, I was actually um, changing some, going down shock oil, changing um, some camber link stuff uh, lengthwise, and I was actually heading down a pretty, definitely down the wrong path, and I essentially stopped what I was doing, and just right before the first round of like the actual like controlled practice, I put back my car to how I pretty much ended with at the warm up, and uh, Dustin found a couple of little setup things that he he was sworn by of uh, how I was working on the track. So I did what he did. Um, it was just like making the rear camber link a little longer, and I left it the same. And I decided, like, look, you know, you're not gonna make a setup change and pick up seven tenths on the track like clearly you have to adapt to certain sections and be a little bit more aggressive in areas to pick up those lap times and sure enough that's exactly what it was i mean there was no setup change that i did to pick up those super fast lap times and be consistent at the same time it was all just driving differently i think i was telling jason the same thing i'm like dude i can't there's no setup change you're going to put on your car and just go seven tenths faster what bruno's doing i was like i put the setup on that I had that I thought it was the best it was going to be. And I just drove and adapted to the car and got faster as I hit the track every single time and just kind of started to peak during the right times. Well, that's, it's always been a, um, one of Pudge's strengths over the years has always been, he has a setup that he would like and he would grow with that car on on the track conditions and he knew that he was used to it by the time push came to shove and you had to perform in either the last round of qualifying or the main. And that has always been one of his strengths. Knowing what kind of piece you have growing with it as the track develops and then having the mental skills to finish the deal. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if you remember, you know, some of those times we download it was just like, look, you know, you're not going to put the different setup on and just magically go like seven tens faster. It's like at the end of the day, you have to drive it. You know, for me, I was taking into consideration, like, look, you haven't really been on this kind of surface as much, and you know, you just need to need to adapt, and it's going to take time. I mean, I wasn't even a threat in any of those, uh, not a serious threat in those, those seating practice runs. And until like literally really the first round of qualifying, like it took me all those runs to really figure out my, how to really drive the track. Yeah. Adjusting your attack to be quick in areas where you're the least comfortable. Um. <clears throat> So, um, Gotti, do you know, do we have some of the, uh, do you have the questions brought up? You, yeah, I was reading some of them off to him. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah, you got into a couple already. Yeah. yeah. Um, There's something to go along with that question. Let me see. Which one was that? Um, so, the second part of that question was, will the, the next associated buggy encapsulate? I got to look up that word, Jason, on Google. Well, it will include some of the features and options for surfaces like the Hootie surface. 
or will remain focused on high traction tracks? Um, believe it or not, everything that we ran had associated production pieces. It was all wow. associated parts that they've they've made, whether it was what we make now or what they've made back in uh, the past. Um, some of the things that they have have maybe been discontinued, but um, there was a, there were a couple pieces that we had that is why we haven't been able to show and underneath the hood parts. But I believe I heard from a little birdie that they're going to do some photo releasing here soon. Uh, okay, because we did have a question: Why wasn't there any body off photos of the car? I think, and and to and to top that off. In today's industry, mm -hmm. there's no real reason to show what you got until you're planning on either selling it or having it available to sell. Because today what people are doing is they're they're robbing say your copying. <laughs> they're robbing your information and your success before you have a chance to use it. Uh, we never seen that happen. <clears throat> over and over again. <laughs> um, and that's what's making the internet and the social media so tough is, um, you know, all these things that you use to, for your success, um, everybody, um, they will, they rob these things and then they try to turn it into their success. Yeah. That's something we didn't have to worry about back in the day. You'd see it in the magazine. It was already three months ago. Yeah. Now yeah, it's like it's, instant and they're copying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, if you're a good racer too and you're detail oriented, when I was in my racing and, and I had the eye on the competition, you don't even have to go to their pits to know certain things. Um, between what people tell you and what you can see from afar, you can normally make very good judgments on what people are doing. Um, and it's very weird how that works, but you don't have to go right up to their pits. Um, just because you're so in tune with your equipment, what it looks like, the general size, the way things are positioned, you know generally what to do by looking. You can look, you know, 10 pit tables away and you can say, and you know already what's going, that guy is kind of doing, um, you know, you can get 75% of the way there by just watching your competition from afar. Um, when you're in your element and when you're not kind to of mention in, when you're pitting literally next to your competition. Yeah. You're, comp yeah, well, you're pit next to your competition, but, um, yeah, it's, it's funny, uh, how some of these things work today, but, um, you know, then you have some teams that come right up to Mayfield and ask them how to dial their car in, you know, and it's like, you know, so many times Ryan's like, look, I'm at the Worlds and I'm dialing in your Kyosho. Like, <laughs> it's like, it's like, hey, you know, I like you and all, but I'm kind of here oh. to get my stuff dialed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, Spencer got it a lot. You know, if you're going good, you're always going to have people asking you. What do you think about your dog bone sweep, Spencer? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll you know, say it's this. Like, I, I think one of the runs, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say it because I'm savage like that. But uh, <laughs> Dustin um, got off the driver's stand, uh, one of the qualifiers, and um, I don't. he said that it really wasn't a good qualifier for him. And Gord t came by right off the driver's stand and Dustin was actually talking to Mayfield and um, Gord's like, Hey, are you running a, how much dog bone sweep are you running in your car? I'll, sh I'll show you mine. If you show me yours. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about like chassis lanes and Gord asked, uh, Gord asked Dustin, hey, what chassis are you running? And Mayfield's like, why would he tell you? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. And they, 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 they walked away. <laughs> well, hey, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, so had to ask. And people yeah. are a little people are a little more chatty today than they used to be. Um, and depending on the level of the race, um, Mayfield's probably the biggest teller. He'll tell the testman sometimes exactly what he's doing because he's just he's just a little crazy like that. Hmm. He's just like, oh, I'll just give him my information. Who cares? Then I'll just beat him. If I beat him telling him everything, then that just makes me feel that much better. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but he's a little crazy. Like you can't you can't necessarily do all that type of stuff. But um that's just how it is. I mean, it's also there's a cockiness and a confidence about it. It's like you can hear these interviews about, you know, when people are really good at stuff, like the Larry Birds talking about how he would tell everybody how the game winning shot was going to go before he even took it. Yeah. You know, he but, would, but say, would it actually work. Yeah. He would come out of the timeout. Yeah. Magic would do the way. same. Magic would do he'd, the same. He'd come out of the timeout and he would tell the guy <laughs> guarding him. He would say, look, he's like, I'm going to get the ball. But, you know, you guys already know that what what's going to happen <laughs> is I, he's like, I, I'm. He's like, my guy's going to set a screen right here. Yeah. And he's like, I'm going to come around. And he's like, and I'm going to shoot the ball right here in your face. And that's exactly what he would do. And he would score. And he, and then, <laughs> but for him, that was part of what got him fired up is he, he would straight up tell you, yeah. you know, what, uh, what he was going to do. And, um, and then he would do it. And then the challenge for him then was to probably do it. Yeah. Mm. That's nuts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, these guys are, you know, people that are good at stuff are crazy like that. Um, you know, I, they're talking about, you know, the, you know, obviously there's the Jordan stuff. There's the, you know, Brady has his stuff, I'm sure. But, yeah, you know, yeah. there was a game they're talking about with Jordan where he said that uh, he hits his first shot in the game and he goes 40. And the guy guarding him is like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. And the next shot he hits, he goes 38. And then he's like, two more shots. And he's like, I finally figured out he's counting backwards from 40. And once he gets to zero, it means he got 40 points on me in this game. Okay. So he's That's like, nuts. you know, so it's like these guys were um, uh, just extremely confident and cocky in what they're doing and um yeah that's how i see some of the stuff when you're feeling really good about a certain track guys talk more and they and they're a little more they're definitely more cocky all right this oh, is look at this what's that jake hauntive did a post i didn't i didn't know but know this um the three first second and third for bodies were all jc and they're all different yeah well, that's interesting. That's pretty. That's pretty nuts. Yeah. So you ran the P two body for the TQ and win, and then David A ran the P two K, and uh, Yasuki ran the F two, right? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Hmm. That is really cool. <laughs> so, how far <clears throat> did you get into the questions here? Which ones do we need? Uh, this one's from Vince Jaron. He says, "Congratulations, Spencer, on your second two wheel drive title." Uh, besides race surfaces, how would, how would you compare these two titles? Um, well, they're completely different <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> um, I don't really know com comparable. How would I compare them? Um, I think for me, the way I, that I've looked at it now of how it's sunk in is, um, you know, I, I'm sure there's some more people that have accomplished this too, but having two, I guess, these kind of world championship titles and two completely different surfaces with the same car um, is kind of cool. Um, I mean, this this one that we just had at the Huddy Arena is probably uh, my, my favorite. I guess they're all my favorite, but I don't know. It just 
I, I was able to surprise myself, even though I, I knew I had a good shot given the circumstances that I was in TQing. Um, but to do it on this kind of surface that, um, I've always been told from others and hearing from others that I wasn't ever really good on. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it, watching, as I told Spencer when we were there, is I think you're in the position to have won maybe the most difficult race to win at the best worlds we've ever been to. And um, that's about as, I think, as big of a compliment as I could give. I think it's, I think the most recent one's definitely more difficult and better to me than the first one uh to me the first one i felt like you didn't really in my at least watching and being there to me it was um much more like you didn't have time to be nervous or think about it to me it was happening and uh to me in this one you had a lot more time to sit on it being tq and then having to come back and win it in A mains two and three, to me that was a much, uh, to me a much bigger statement. To me, that's the hardest way to do it, and in the most maybe difficult track, but the best race uh, in general. Um, that's kind of the way I see it. Yeah, I mean, I definitely thought that the first one um, was kind of laid out a little differently, but. Um, I mean, it was just, it was just nuts being at the Huddy Arena and just, just all the talk leading up to it. I mean, I, I, I got so sick and tired of just all the talk. I mean, I was one of the guys that were just talking all the smack about it. I mean, I mean, I'm like, look, this is going to (laughs) be insanely difficult to accomplish. Like, and I wasn't even considering myself a freaking, a contender for, you know, that kind of position. I mean, I was, I mean, I literally wrote it, wrote down a goal of just like, you know, you can be in the top five. That's pretty freaking good. So, um, uh, where, where else were you at? Second part of that question with all your accolades, where does being the guest on Ripcast episode 200 rank? What is it? Where does being the guest on Ripcast 200 rank of all your accomplishments that you've done? Where does this rank being the guest? Oh, it's got to be. Um, I would say this one's probably one of the best, but the other one I, I like talking about when we were talking about the Kinlaw tools and all that. Stuff. Wow. Yes. Yes. So that one was a good one. Right. So that's first, second, and then the then the world championships. Okay. Yeah, and I would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, let's see. Where else are we at here? What's a t- uh, what's a typical week like f- for Spencer at home as far as work, schedule, practicing, wrenching, etc.? What's a typical week like for you? Well, if I'm not going to an event in the week, I'm I'm always watching or listening to film from races from that race that I'm going to. Okay. Um whether I'm going to the gym or if I'm prepping my cars for that race. I mean, it's, I'm literally doing everything RC. I mean, unless I'm going to a, like a friend's house to go swimming. I mean, it's everything every day that I wake up and something has, something has came up with RC. And, um, I mean, it's really just preparation for the next race is really what I do. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting there, wake up, eat some breakfast. And, um, while breakfast, I'm watching a race video from either the last race I was just at or the race, I'm, a race that I'm, that, that I'm going to from last year. Um, and, uh, reading some new stuff as far as like, you know, RC news and stuff like that. And, uh, it's really just all about the preparation that's, that I'm really doing during the week. I mean, I'm building a car right now as we speak for the cardboard race at IOCC. And, um, 
it's just for me, it's all about getting ahead of the game because if you can be ahead of the game, yeah, then <clears throat> you're doing all right. Because I like to come back from my race that I'm going to be going to, and knowing that my stuff is already prepared for the next race when I come back, I can start working on for the next race after that race for when I come back. Mm. It just makes it a lot easier on me to not have to worry about staying up on those late nights. And even though that I, I enjoyed it when I was, you know, six years ago doing all those all nighters with wrenching, but I found myself a good balance on, on the RCE and wrenching and all that stuff. I mean, when I say I don't, when I do it every day, I mean, it's, a good portion of it. Um, I mean, when I'm on the couch, if I, you know, take an hour off or something, I watch TV and then I'm like, all right, this is lame. And then I go on YouTube <laughs> and then watch a YouTube video of an RC race. Wow. Or something. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm always talking with my guys. I, I text a lot with Jason. Um, and I talk a lot with Cody Newmandal and Brent and, me and Alex K and Jackson have become really good friends. Um, and, you know, I FaceTime them every day as I'm wrenching. I mean, Alex, as of right now, since he's in college, he's, you know, he's been doing a lot of schoolwork. So, like, I'll be working on my RC stuff and he's doing his schoolwork. And Jackson's out in Florida at, at his parents' condo and I'm FaceTiming him as he's working on his tour drive car for that uh, race he was just at. And, I mean, just staying active with the community. I mean, ultimately, a lot of these guys that I've been around for so, so much, so long now, like Jason and Cody and Brent or Alex or Mayfield or Tanner Denny. I mean, we're essentially just, you know, we're all family. And it's, it's my my uh, happy place. And that's what yeah. just keeps me keeps me rolling, really. that's what it's all about i definitely wouldn't say i get overwhelmed um but maybe that's just because i'm still young and um, i mean i definitely don't look at this as a as a job by any by any stretch i mean it's it's still a pretty big hobby of mine here's a question i came into also um would you still race rc for fun and not for a paycheck. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yep. I don't know what the hell I would do <laughs> if I wasn't racing, but I mean, <laughs> I would figure it out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what's your mindset for races? Are you are you thinking about are you thinking about the check and the results, or can you ever just relax and enjoy driving? Um. Honestly, when I go to these races, um, like the way that I've always looked at it is to do the best I possibly can. And then whatever the result is, you kind of know, like, all right, well, now that the race is over, you know, you know, like if you made some contingency money for winning or whatnot. But when I'm at the event, that's the, the last thing on my mind. I mean, um, it, I don't, I don't need to, to win a race to pay my mortgage. Um, because one, I don't have a mortgage. <laughs> uh, I don't really have any bills. So, I mean, yeah. the only bill I have is my car payment. Well, no, actually my insurance, my truck's paid off. It's been paid off, but, um, insurance and stuff like that. But what, um, what, what I see, I mean, that, that, um, what I see out there is I see the drivers making decisions during the weekend that is about the results, not necessarily about the money. Um, I think they feel like if they're doing the very best they can, that if there is money on the line, it will come. But I feel like they're making decisions most all the time about um, just about the results. Um, 
and it's it's just fighting for a result. And if there's money that comes with it at the end, so be it. But they're fighting for a result. Yeah, I mean, obviously, from your perspective, uh, I mean, that's I'm sure that means something to you, given that you're one of the guys that has the these kind of structures for for results. Um, but at the same time, I mean, a lot of them. I mean, there are there are a lot of people that I mean, a good portion of their the money that they've achieved over the year, a lot of it comes from bonuses too. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think if you start thinking about the money part of it, it's hard to, uh, to perform exactly the way you should perform. I think if you're, if you're, uh, you're doing it because you're dedicated and you are just into the result then the rest of it comes. If you're only doing it for that money result, it's not going to come as easy. Um, if the race was actual, actually open tire, what would, what tires would you have ran? Um, I probably would have would have uh, for sure ran like an ellipse kind of tire um, in I guess a super soft or mega soft compound, but Honestly, I would, I would have, I would have liked to have tried the complete opposite spectrum. Now, this is a little <laughs> bit of a Kinwald trick. I would have liked to have tried like the straight clays, like with the out sauce. Mm. I don't know. I feel that if you just had like a super hard tire, it would just kind of work. I'm pretty sure that we could have come up with something better. Than what you know oh, yeah. for how the tr- how the track progressed to what we could have raced on with open tire, but I couldn't imagine trying to do that race with open tires. It would have been whew. brutal, brutal to say well, the least. Wait till we go to a race when it's an open tire at a carpet race. That's going to be a nightmare because. <laughs> We haven't done that yet in the States. Yeah, I I think uh, in some of these situations, it's just better for the race to have a control tire because otherwise it's it's almost impossible to to have what you need. What are we doing in the back? Me? You you taking off chassis tape? (laughs) I'm trying to find ball clubs for my uh, J Concepts black fin turnbuckles. So, what's our next question here? Th- th- I like this one here. Here we go. Uh, Eric Vocal. Um, congrats on the big win, Spencer, from Eric. Um, you have mentioned in a few videos that you have been studying and reading about Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. What are some of the mental takeaways you have learned that you have applied to your own program? Um. Well, the biggest thing that I've been reading, I've, I've read his book on the, his mindset and stuff, but I'm actually reading this new book. Uh, but it's really using like the positive uh, mindset um, for these races, thinking positive, um, regardless of really what's going on. Um, you know, scenarios of, man, you know, not doing that well. But, you know, having trust in yourself and using like some positive energy to better, better it. Uh, A lot of people, a lot of people that race nowadays do like uh, dwell on their bad results. Um, They have have a hard time forgetting on their bad run that they had. Um, And, you know, dwelling on like, for as what Brady says, negative energy, it just leads to just um, more domino effect or just negative things to happen. Mm-hmm. Think positive, positive things happen. Think negative, negative things happen. Yeah. Um, that's really the biggest thing um, that I've read. Um, this other book I've been reading, it's called Top Dog. Um and it's more about the actual like 
genetics of of like people that are good under pressure and is it true to be more genetically inclined for those these kind of circumstances and uh there is this this other book is actually way more uh in tune with like these kind of chromosomes of in your body that feed these sort of like this is just i'm talking like this is not probably what people want to hear but like these sort of like um you know nerve waves to your brain when like you get nervous or you're you know you, you know when your heart rate goes up and mm -hmm. that's that's actually what i'm reading now but mainly for like this racist stuff that I've been, been really just trying to keep a positive mindsets at all these races. And when you're doing bad, you know, look back at, at what you were able to do in the past. If you had some success at that particular track and like, look, you know, you've done it once you can do it again. You know, what's the big deal. Um, and stuff like that is really, really what I tried to have been focusing on um because i mean a lot of when you go to these, these 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 races i mean i mean you walk around the pits and they're like oh my car sucks this thing is a pile of crap like well it's like look you just won the nationals last week like what's the big deal yeah like what you know <laughs> so i've been in those i've been in those circumstances and done it i've done it with jason i'm i i've had bad races like you know, eight still, whatever. I just can't figure it out. And it's like, well, you know, you did well at this last race. And so, I mean, I, that's the stuff that I've been trying to better myself on. Um, and really just look for things that you can improve on. I mean, you know, you had a, you know, winning the worlds in the tour dive class at this, you know, how do you, you know, watching some, some things going back. I'm like, I there could have been a lot of things I could have done better um, on the track. And, you know, that's stuff that I'll use for the next race that I'll try to work on and, and do that. And just trying to um, master, master it. I mean, there's no such thing of, as being perfect, but... Um, you know, given some of this, some of the things that could have happened in like that A1 or A2, especially in A2, I mean, I could have lost that race easily. I had a pretty big flip over linen on my wheels on the left side and it could have been over right there. So, um, just keeping positive on the driver's stand and not letting things, um, overtake you mentally and not taking yourself out of it yeah so quickly a lot of people get so agitated on the driver's stand that they just throw it all away when realistically they could have came back from one or two of those same mistakes that they've had and still won the race um you know especially at these nitro races so that's where i'm at positive mindset uh, Jason, uh, he also, uh, Eric also says, thanks for making those behind the scene videos. Yeah, no problem. Thank um, you for watching. Yeah. And something he, uh, something I noticed was the guy vacuuming the green turf on the track. How often was this going on? <laughs> I think they're doing it every night. Okay. Uh, he also noticed how clean and organized the facility was. Uh, why do you think there are not more major races at this arena? I think they have a couple there every year. Um, I think, yeah, I think they have a couple there every year, whether it's EOS, ETS. Um, but, I mean, I don't think they can really club race there because I don't really think there's any a, a lot of locals that are racing. So it's more like a big race facility. It's pretty uh, much a big practice facility for their for Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> and on, I mean, let's be honest here. They they assen they essentially fly them in, jeez, for the practice before an ELS. He runs there for three or four days. This is what he's telling me, and then they fly to the race, does the race, wins the race, goes home. Then now there's a there's an ETS on road race. They fly him back to Huddy, race on on road, 
practices for on road three or four days, then fly him to the on road on road race, wins that race, goes back home, and the routine just keeps on coming. And not to mention, now, this may sound like I'm jealous, but uh, I'm I really am jealous. But <laughs> um, when they have when he flies when Bruno's out running off road, uh-huh. Marn Bayer's back at back at the facility working on the on-road program and vice versa when when they're uh when they're out there racing it's unreal so yeah i mean i've been we took a walk through their facility i don't know if you guys got into got into this did you ever talk about the the walkthrough of the, the place jason no yeah, I mean, that's what we talked about while we were there was, um, you know, we don't really know how they have what they have uh, <laughs> at that facility because I mean, we're talking about millions. Like, this is the Trump thing, right? Millions and millions and millions. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars. This More like tens of millions of dollars. It's tens of millions of dollars. Um, there's got to be 20 plus million dollars in CNC equipment and machines. Oh the buildings goodness. have to be they're you know, five or $10 million. I mean, we're, if you were, to, you, there's no way, um, you could build any of this in the U S and do it. It's impossible. Um, I don't know how they have it. Um, they have the nicest building in the whole town. Um, <laughs> I think it's right, the whole, whole country. It's in the right? whole country. No, I know. I mean, it's the nicest building in the town. We'll at least say that. Um, well, it's, for sure it, that. It's, everything is tiled inside the, the track. The bathrooms are amazing. It's top of the line. Everything, everywhere. The the like, the like actual, um, you know, like on a in, in construction, they call them a water closet. But the toilet, the toilet is amazing. Uh, it's like the <laughs> top of the line. Every it's top of the line. Everything, the, even the toilet paper. It was top notch. Oh, yeah, three ply, like huh? This, like this stuff. I mean, this place is. It's no. Um, it is like the Disney World of RC racing. I mean, it's. Jeez. I mean, we're sitting out there on this patio having lunch. Amazing food, right, Spencer? Oh God, the food was awesome. Spaghetti was top. Uh, Top of the line. It, it, really? Spaghetti? Top three. He said top three spaghetti of all time. We're getting it at the track. Yeah. it's. I, I think one of the days I, I bumped it up to the best. Yeah, you did. You bumped it up to the best spaghetti you've ever had. <laughs> is from the Hootie Arena in Trenson, Slovakia. Um, <laughs> but... Yeah, it's nobody really knows how, how come they have uh, is what they have. Um, and it, it, it is awesome. It, but somebody has to maintain it, too. There is it's not like somebody just uh, it, it's it's really the facility that when somebody tells you if I won the lottery, I would do this. Mm-hmm. And it would have to be one of those Powerball, like five hundred million dollar lotteries to get all the stuff that. It, it, to make it better, you would have to have the five hundred million dollar Powerball. <laughs> like, it's just, it's just. I mean, this I is unreal. Wanna, I don't, I don't want to make it too crazy. Yeah. But, it's but it's even, crazy though. But, <laughs> but even things, you know. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too unrealistic, but it's it's nice and certainly. It's the nicest building in the town, and certainly you can't you can't make RC racing cars and have this type of investment. Hmm. So it just really makes you wonder. I mean, I went. I went. Uh, Justin Doyle gave us a tour of the NASCAR uh, shop that he works at, and oh man. Uh, and, uh, Don't tell me this is better than that. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> but, but you know, there there are some similarities in terms of the uh, arrangement. <laughs> the, what was that? That was my dog. He's, 
he's just he's just wandering around. Oh, okay. <laughs> there's my little Frenchie. <laughs> yeah, there's some there's some similarities in terms of how the cleanliness, the arrangement, yeah. um, and it, it, it's just impressive. And all you can really say is that it's you're happy that somebody has that that we're able to visit and use um but there's a lot of jealousy too i mean it makes everybody a little jealous because you're like god how does how does this how do they have all this (laughs) yeah i think like go ahead but it is i mean it's it it is um but you still have to take care of it you do have to take care of it you have to work it's not like they're just getting, you know, somebody's giving it all. They're obviously working, and it looks nice. And they've, they're keep, they're keep, they're keeping it. They're maintaining it. Man, well, they must, they must do something here? else besides RC then. Well, I don't know. It, there's, there's not a lot of info, and sometimes you're like afraid to ask. <laughs> because and it's not because you just don't know if it's polite. It's like you, everyone just kind of wonders, you know. Well, and, and, and you tell the owners or you know, uh, the, the hoodie guys, when you're there, you're just like, you know, you're always like, you shake their hands. Like, that's amazing. We've had a great time. It's a nice place. And, and they kind of look at you and shake their head like, yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. Like, it's not like, you know, uh, you know, and in, in the back of your head, you're just going, this is millions and millions. Yeah. <laughs> <of time." laughs> They have, they probably, they probably have, uh, you know, five plus million dollars just in, um, cause we walked through their, their, uh, inventory. They must have that much just in inventory. Jeez. <clears throat> well, that's, what are you going to do? That's nice. Good for them. I would say. No, I- <laughs> How do you lose? You should be winning every race. <laughs> well, how, yeah. How how do they not just get the top drivers just come to Spencer and say, "Here, here's a cup." You know, here here's a huge contract. Come to our team. They have one of the best guys, if not the best guy. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it was a very so impressive. Speak, it was a very impressive trip. Slovakia was we had a great time uh everywhere we went to eat was was really good uh tell us tell us about the your favorite place Spencer um I mean the spaghetti at Huddy was just unreal but that uh little Italian joint that we went to we went to it pretty much every night um we uh we would go there and we would always show up with like a party at, at least of, of nine. And there it's like, they hated us when we showed up with a party this big. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I, you know, we pretty much ordered everything on the menu at least once. And like the last three days, like Dustin tried the ribs mm-hmm. and the ribs were like the best ribs I've ever ate in my life. I think he, he said the same thing. Jeez. He he did. He was Thomas tried them. He loved them. I just kept getting the lasagna. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> uh, well, they put on a hell of an event. So the um, what was it? My, the hotel I stayed at. Um, you know, we got a big room, and you did look small. Well. I'll have to show you. Well, there's a picture from both sides, but it was it was big. Okay. Uh, uh, the actually the food at our hotel was really good. I mean, we didn't really want to leave our hotel to go <laughs> eat anywhere else. It was Spencer that's like, you gotta come over to this other place. So we're like, all right. So we went over there, and then pretty soon we're like, all right, well, we'll go there for like three nights in a row. Yeah. Wow. Speranza. That was the name of the place. Um, driving was pretty good. All the cars, um, you know, you, you still drive on the, the drive on the right side of the road. Driving was pretty, was pretty simple for most. 
Uh, the hotel to the track was always pretty close, 10 minutes probably. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, we flew. Well, we flew into Vienna, Aust- Austria, and then we had to drive over to Trents and. But what was that about? Hour and a half, Spencer, something like that. Uh, Spencer drop off. Oh, maybe he is. Oh, maybe, maybe he's oh. dropped off. Uh, he might be trying to get a hold of me. Oh, what's he's, going on? He's he's typing to me right now. I'll tell him I'm calling him. Okay. Hello. Oh, there you go. I don't know what happened. You got sprinted. I don't know what went on there. I didn't even, didn't even show that you dropped off. What did this so mean that else? dropped off? Yeah. Yeah. It was weird, hmm. but it still showed you in the call. So I have no idea. Uh, what were you saying, Jason? We're gonna close it out then. Um, I saw Kyle Predmore said besides the trophy grill, what was the best thing about the race? But we kind of went into that already. Yeah. We talked, I think we covered pretty I mean, much everything in there. We're, we're yeah, we're pretty much gushing about this race. Yeah. Uh, well, it turned out to be a great event. I know everybody's a little worried, but uh, you know, Spencer won. Can't get any better than that. Well, yeah, we could have took four wheel, but we're gonna do right. They, they say that uh, the next world is going to be in the USA. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Any speculation? I have, I have predictions. Oh, okay. oh, let's hear it. Where's your prediction? All right. My predictions is that it will be, well, it's going to be in America, but it's going to be at an eight scale track outdoors. And I think it's going to be in Florida. Oh. And if it's not in Florida, and it's not an eight scale track plan B, it will be at OCRC. What do you think of that prediction, Jason? <sighs> One of these eight scale owners are going to eat it up and have it at their eight scale track for a 10 scale race. Hmm. I think there's only two places it's going to be. Go ahead. I think it's either going to be at A Main Hobbies. Or it's going to be at Thornhill in Texas. That's my prediction. Okay. Great so choice. Eight scale tracks. They're both eight scale tracks. Yeah. Wow. But I, I think you would cater. The size will be toned down a little. Uh, but yeah, they are right now eight scale tracks. They're also both well, one's covered. Um. I think A Main's the one that has the. I think A Main has the the man the manpower to do it right, and they've hosted it before. Actually, the last time I was here, and the reason I think they they just have the manpower and the money to do it correctly. I think most places aren't going to have the time, money, or the personnel to do it correctly, and that's the reason I would I would like it to be at other places it certainly would be awesome to be in florida but i don't know if they have the the, the help to do it uh, i mean the, the track that we had the nationals at could do the worlds and it'd be cool um the one in uh, lake city uh, they could do the worlds uh the worlds could be at a number of different tracks in florida um but i don't know that they have the manpower to do the race and, or the more than you have to have money sponsorship dollars in uh it's uh that's why the world's you know uh, the world's in slovakia was great they had the money to do it right uh, finland, finland had um a ton of volunteers that's why they were able to do so well they had a hundred volunteers in finland uh, wow. to do to do the race and that one went so well and you know the one before you know there was also the one at yatabi in japan went so well but they had the the um the manpower and sponsorship and the experience to do it right uh, that's the tough part is having all those components i there's several tracks i think would be great to see it at the part that i don't the reason i wouldn't think it could be at oc rc is because they'd have to close the track for a long time 
and they don't i wouldn't think they'd want to do that mm. so in order to host Who's the money? worlds they they would have to close the track for several weeks and i think that they wouldn't be willing to do that or they couldn't you know you just can't close the track and not take drivers you know unless you said hey these guys aren't signed up for the world and they can still race or you know i I don't know what the situation would be um maybe that would be what you'd have to work out but um you know to me it would be boring to have the worlds at ocrc because i feel like we're already there enough i i like that whole like idea of it being different for everybody um and I wish there was no warm up. I wish we would just set up a track somewhere. We pick the tires and we run a race on a track that nobody's ever ran on before. I think that's the ultimate way to do it. Yeah. Like uh, Richard of the world in Vegas. Yeah. The one he did there at silver Silverton in Vegas. Um, yeah, I think ultimately that's how you want to have a world go down is it's brand new for everybody. You've never been on the driver's stand. You've never been around the track under any circumstances other than the first practice. And the tires are controlled, so you don't have to figure that part out. You just go with it. And um, To me, those are the exciting ones because you just never know. Uh, there's a lot more... I like Unknowns. it. I like, I like that. But we'll see. I, either way, uh, I mean, I, man, it'd be awesome if it was in Florida. We wouldn't, you know, it'd be we wouldn't have to travel that much. But I don't. I could see the Lake City guys thinking they could do it, and I think they have the track for it. But they'd have to get a lot of help. Hmm. Um. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's it from my end. Um, what else can we say? Good job. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations, champ. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh big thanks for We're being on to the next race. We're on to the next we're, one. That's your favorite one, the next the next title. Well, we're that's on, the thing. That's we're the on thing to is Cincinnati. You can <laughs> yes. you can um you can only celebrate for so long. And then it has to become about that next one. Right. All right. Well, this was episode 200 with the champ, Spencer Rifkin. Appreciate it being here. The big 200. It's got to feel special for you. Yeah, and, I'm, uh, I'm pretty stoked that we're uh, 200. That's awesome. I appreciate you guys having me for sure. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. We got we got to talk about doing a Patriots podcast together, me and you. Yeah. Wouldn't that be I fun? I'm totally down. We should do that. Jason's like rolling his eyes over there. Yeah, I think you guys should do it. I, I think we should. It'd be fun. You know, we don't, yeah, we, it would be. You know, obviously Spencer don't have a lot of time, but we can make him short and just do it whenever <laughs> he can. So I, I, I think that'd be fun. We'll talk. We'll talk about that, Spencer. So yeah, we can set that up. Um. So hey, you want to give a shout out to everybody, your sponsors, and uh, where we could find you because you're doing these Facebook videos that are awesome. People are loving these things. So yeah, um, I'm uh, been really pleased for the people that I've been watching it. But yeah, it wouldn't wouldn't be possible without these guys that support me. Um, of course, with uh, Jason from J Concepts, Team Associated, Hobby Wing, MX, Pro Tech, I mean Hobby, Sawbox, Mataba, Hobby Action, OCRC, Sticker One, and uh, Factory Team. Uh, definitely, definitely um, honored to be a part of the whole the whole team and. Um, it's been uh, an awesome, awesome adventure, and I'm looking forward to see what happens down the road. Yeah. And uh, how often do you do these videos then on, on Facebook? I do it once a month uh, okay. for the live videos, but um, I've started like my own YouTube channel um, for you know whether it's tips or tricks or vlogs or whatever it may be. I. I I've been trying to do it at least do that also once a month. Um, What's your channel? How do we find that? It's just Spencer Rifkin is the the channel. There you and go. You'll see see it pop up uh, on there, and you get to see some um, some things that I've done with um, 
associated uh, J Concepts, um, and other sponsors as well. Um, so the goal is to have, I have a lot of um, requests to do some videos so that it's, the goal is to um, get them accomplished for you guys and uh hopefully it's been hopefully it's been helping you guys out the response has been been awesome on the live videos um so we'll see how it goes for the youtube all right there we have it episode 200 (laughs) in the books on the road to is this the road to 300 now jason (laughs) <laughs> oh, let's say the it's it's the road f- to two twenty five. Two twenty five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It took us a while to get here, but hey, seven years later, we're still here. So, oh, so we're still here. How about that, Spencer? Still here. Yep, we're still here. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. All right, guys, we'll catch you on episode two hundred one. Thanks, Dottie. Thanks, Jero.